So what is it that we need to lay at his feet? What is it that we need to give up? come before you right now offering up everything that we have everything that we are God it's proven over and over again that every time we try to do something that doesn't line up with your will and doesn't line up with your grace it just doesn't work God all it creates is dead ends all it creates is heartaches all it creates is pain and sorrow and God you are everything that we need so I pray Lord that in this congregation Whatever, whatever chains we need to break, whatever things we need to lay at your feet, that we can just do that in a great way, Lord, knowing that you're greater than all those things. Knowing that you can be glorified and you can be shown as perfect over everything that is imperfect, God. And I pray that our lives can just speak that. 
as Edgardo come to speak, and he comes to talk about how we can be like you, God. See, it's not about missions. It's not about giving. It's not about any of that. It's about being like you because your heart gives. Your heart loves unconditionally. Your heart is perfect. And we cannot strive for that without striving for you first, God. And I pray today that we make that commitment that it's about being like you and then everything else will happen. God, be with Edgardo right now. Speak through him. Give him the words that you want to penetrate into our hearts, God. We love you. In your name we pray. get to celebrate a baptism, so please be seated. Good morning. Yes. This morning we have with us uh, Brother Louis Balcazar. Uh, by the way, today is his birthday, so say happy birthday to Louis. <laughs> you know, he was talking there with me and Jackson, and Louis says, I want to take my birthday to the next level. So he understands that he was born from his mother's womb, but he is now born in the blood shed by Jesus Christ. Louis has been in conversation with Pastor Rotramel, and he has expressed that he has received Jesus into his heart as his Lord and Savior. Is that so? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this morning, as, as a church, we want to Symbolize, we just want to, this to be a public expression of the decision that you have taken already in your heart. The water has nothing to do with it. This is just a symbol of what you are doing as you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So, so in obedience to the commandment of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and upon your profession of faith, we baptize you. We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. Let's worship, church. Amen. So, today, Pastor Agardo's sermon is just incredible. 
he talks about the idea that how can we possibly share the love of Christ if he's not the first thing we're searching for? You see, in missions, what happens is sometimes it's the people that got it all together going down there to help the lesser people. That's kind of the idea we have sometimes if we're not careful. But, but God says, the first thing in the Beatitudes, it says, blessed are those who are broken in spirit. That means every one of us is broken. We're hopeless. We're helpless without Christ. And when we approach missions, this is more of an idea that the only thing I have to offer you, and money goes away and all the other stuff goes away, the only thing I can offer you is the only thing that I can't earn and I can't gain myself, and that is the salvation of Jesus Christ. So today as we sing this beautiful song, Share His Love, that we haven't ever sung since I've been here, and I apologize, I want you to just pay attention to these beautiful words that just over and over talk about how we need to approach sharing his amazing love. So please stand with me as we continue to sing and we continue to worship. and please be seated. I want to introduce someone to you real quick. This is Jan McFarland. And Ms. McFarland, can you come over here? I'm going to help her down these steps real quick. Apparently, she doesn't need my help, all right? So she's just going to come over here by herself. I want to introduce Ms. McFarland to you. The reason I call her Ms. McFarland because she was a high school teacher and a middle school teacher and an elementary teacher for 
at least five years, all right? Oh, 45 years, I'm sorry, I was close, all right? And for at least 45 years, and the cool thing about Miss McFarland is TMEA is a big music thing in Texas. She's been the only choir other than UTEP to take a TMEA honors choir, which is a huge thing from El Paso, huge thing. So this lady is legit, all right? She's a real thing. And this coming Tuesday at 10.30 in the morning, we're starting this special choir. It's called the Primetime Singers. And what we're going to do basically is come in. Everyone that's got time at 10.30, we're going to worship. We're going to sing. We're going to form fellowship. We're just going to enjoy um, using the gifts God's given us. Now, I know some of you in here are going, okay, I haven't sang for 25 years, all right? I understand that, but do you understand the, the physical gains, the way it increases your lung capacity, so many physical things, but the most important is a time where we can just come together and worship. That's what it comes down to. And so I want to just ask Ms. McFarland one question. And when I talked to her a while back, I said, this, this is a, a really cool idea where we can really bring in some of our community, some of our church to come in and sing together. Why would you want to do this? You're retired. I mean, you're retired. Why wouldn't you want to stay home and watch like TV shows and stuff? I think that's what retired people do, right? But anyways, um, she, um, she said, um, this is so important to me. Let me let her put it in her words why a choir like this is so important to you. First, I'm a little nervous about this. When I talk about working with choir, I'm usually this way. <laughs> and it's much easier for me to work that way than this way. Science has found out that when choirs sing together, there's scientific proof that blood pressures tend to even out and become one. Heartbeats start to come together and beat as one. Um, breathing is done in unison, that means in one. And more than that, my philosophy is that the human voice is the only instrument itself touched by God's hands, thereby being the best instrument to sing his praise. And I don't think that it's an accident that everything comes together when we're singing his praise. And so as an outreach, uh, Elvin and I have talked about this, as an outreach, not just here, but throughout our community, we want to have this chance of being able to praise, prayer, and fellowship. And so I'm so excited, I can barely stand it, and I'm so tired of veggie tales, you just don't know. <laughs> I, I stay at home and I take care of my one-year-old granddaughter who in, her, in itself is a miracle she was never supposed to happen. So yeah, I'm tired of Veggie Tales. I'm ready to get on to fellowship again. So please come. We welcome you all Tuesday at 1030. Great, put those hands together, yes. Amen. And I don't know what's wrong with her. I love Veggie Tales. That's the best thing ever, all right? So 1030, I'd just like to invite you guys. And right afterwards, we're gonna have a free lunch and just hang out and get to know each other. And so we're so excited. Back to Edgardo's sermon, we have this beautiful song, People Need the Lord. What else do we need to say?
Please turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 25, and we are going to be reading from 31 through 46. When was the last time you ever think about the ends of times? When was the last time you ever think about the day that you will stand before King Jesus? under his judgment of the ways in which you have lived your lives. Here in chapter 25, we have King Jesus speaking to his disciples. If you look on chapter 24 and verse 3, he says, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And we read here in verse 31 of chapter 26, 25. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. This is Jesus' last message, like the very, very last message before his death on the cross for you and for me. And he's here trying to describe to his disciples because he wants them to be prepared. He wants them to be ready for that day when history as we know it will come to an end. You better believe it. The delay does not mean that it will not happen. The reason why it hasn't happened as yet, according to Peter, is because he doesn't want any to perish, but all to be saved. And so he's telling his disciples here that the Son of Man will come, not if he comes, when he comes. We don't know when that will be. It could be tomorrow. It could be even today, next week, in a month, in a year, in a thousand years. We, we don't know, but for sure we know that he is coming. And he is not coming alone. He is coming well accompanied. The scripture tells us, if you read in Revelation chapter 4, it says that, 5.11, it says that 10,000 times, 10,000 times angels will be with him. Millions of angels. This is a very vivid scene. It says that all nations, and it's not talking about Colombia or Uruguay or, or United States. It's talking about individual people from all nations will be standing before him. You, me, and each and every one of us will be standing before King Jesus, gathered before him. 
And this will be a time of, of no excuses, no exceptions. In legal terms, there will be no appeal. And you will be standing right in front of him, all of us. And we will hear these words. It says that he will call out, some will go to his right, and he will call some to his left. Those who he will call to his right, he will say, come, you are welcome. Uh, you are blessed by my, by my father. He didn't say, come you who are perfect or come you who never sin." He says, come you who are blessed. Come you, those of you who have received my grace and my salvation, come in and inherit the kingdom of God. Those to his left, he will say to them, depart from me. You are cursed and you will inherit eternal fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Just imagine standing there before King Jesus and hearing these words. On which side you think you will be called? And a question to answer here is according to what standard he's measuring who will be on his, on his right and who will be on his left. Could it be what it says here in verse 35? Could it be, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, walking the streets of El Paso, Seeing all these restaurants and diners, uh, tons of food being wasted. Did you feed me or didn't you feed me? I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me. Just came in from Mexico or some far country, new in town, new in the city, new in school, new in job, new at UTEP? Did you welcome me? Did you even introduce yourself to me? I was in prison, yes, for my crimes, but yet a child of God, did you visit me? I was naked, and you gave me clothes. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did these things happen? We need to be aware that when all is said and done, the king and judge will call you to account with this question. How did you respond to human needs? How did you respond to human needs? Now, it needs to be clarified that this passage of Scripture has been misinterpreted many, many often. Particularly in some way by what we know as the theology of liberation and the social gospel. When I was at Baylor University, I had the privilege to listen to a presentation by a priest, Gustavo Gutierrez. He's a Peruvian priest, a Dominican priest, and he is known as the father of liberation theology. And he speaks about what is called uh, the preferential option for the poor. He thinks that uh, if you read scripture, and, and that's true, you will always find that God or Jesus is always helping the poor. He's always talking about helping the poor, helping the orphans. And he criticizes the governments in Latin America. and He, he even criticizes the Catholic Church uh, for the injustices that uh, people suffered in these countries, the poverty that exists in these countries. And one of the main questions that Gustavo Gutierrez asks is, how can we show poor people 
that God loved them. One of the passages of scripture that he founds his theology on is precisely this chapter 25 of, of the book of Matthew. One of the things that Gustavo Gutierrez did, he moved out from the luxurious apartment in which he was living at the parish in Peru, and he, he moved into a small, humble apartment in one of the poorest areas of, of Lima, Peru. Uh, thinking about this way of being and living among the poor. And one of their idea, one of their view is that the more you serve the poor, the more you serve Jesus. This is what the scripture is telling him here. It says, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was in need of clothes and you clothed me in prison and you visited me. And it's then it's righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you or thirsty and gave you something to eat? When did we see you this, that, that? He says, when did we see you sick and in prison? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. So the closer we are to the poor, the closer we are to Jesus. And so Gustavo Gutierrez moved into this poor community so that he can be closer to Jesus. I have a little problem with that, and we need to be careful about the way we interpret this passage of Scripture on what really Jesus is teaching us here. The question is, why did these righteous people did what they did? Because we can fall into a sense of self-righteousness whenever we are serving because one of the things that he is suggesting here and that liberation theology, don't get me wrong, I like a lot of things about liberation theology and the social gospel. They have a lot of important teachings. But there is a sense of uh, self-righteousness that can, comes up in, into our minds and hearts and, and think that if you are not serving the poor, if you are not living among the poor, then you are not, serving Jesus or you are not close to Jesus, if you are, are giving a, a, a Bible school or Bible class here at the church or if you are serving a good news club at Fort Bliss, uh, that if you are not close to the poor, you are not close to God. Another issue that can happen here and that liberation theology tends to lead is what we call as justification by works. And that's not what, I mean, easily you can interpret this. If you do this, if you feed, if you give clothing, if you visit the sick, come in, come in, come in. That's not what the scripture is telling us here. We know that we are saved by grace, amen, through faith in Jesus Christ. It is not by works, Philippians says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. Salvation is by faith, and faith alone. So why did the righteous people did what they did? Why they fed? Why they visit the sick? Why they did these things? The answer is right here in this passage of Scripture. Look on their response in verse 40. Or in verse 39. When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? When did we see you a stranger? When? When? They were surprised. They were perplexed. They were unaware. They were not thinking that they have done anything for Jesus. When did we did, did these things for you? When? You see, one of the things that is important to notice here 
is that these people were serving and they were not taking record of what they were doing. They were serving and they were not looking into what they were doing to get any kind of glory or any kind of praise or to feel any sense of self-righteousness. They were not doing that. They were serving from a different motivation. They were serving because they have experienced the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. That's why they were serving. They were not serving to be saved or to earn salvation. They knew that they cannot earn salvation. You see, when they were serving, it's not that they were seeing Jesus in the people that they were helping. They were seeing themselves when they were serving the poor. They were recognizing that they were hungry and Jesus fed them. Amen? Because he is the bread of life. They were thirsty as we were thirsty one day and Jesus quenched our thirst with the blood of the Lamb. Because he is the living water, isn't it? They were naked and they recognized that they were clothed in the righteousness, in the robe of righteousness. They were strangers in a foreign land. We are strangers in a foreign land. We are pilgrims in this foreign land. But he went to prepare a place for us that we may be with him forever. They were in prison. We were in prison in our sins and trespasses. But I read somewhere that he came to set the captive free. And so they were embracing the grace and the love that we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, my friends, whenever we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Scripture tells us in in Romans 5, 5, that Jesus Christ poured his love into our hearts. Amen? He poured his love into our hearts. And when the love starts to overflow in our hearts, it starts to reach out and overflow to others. You remember in Matthew 22nd, 22nd chapter of Matthew, three chapters earlier, when Jesus was teaching his disciples about the great commandment, when he said, he didn't say, feed me. He didn't say, feed my neighbor. He didn't say, give drink to my neighbor. He didn't say, uh, visit the sick. He didn't say, go to the prison. He didn't say that. What he said was, Love me with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your soul. And go and love your neighbor as you love yourself. You see, feeding is loving action. Serving is loving action. Helping the strangers is love in action. It's not about how hard... And the numbers of ministries that we have here at First Baptist Church. It's not primarily about how much clothes we give out or how much visit we make to the hospitals. Not how many years in ministry, preaching, teaching, evangelizing, discipling, singing. You all remember that church, that congregation, I think it was the Ephesus church in Revelation chapter 4. Chapter 2. You remember that church? Look what it says. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. And have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name. 
and have not grown weary, yet I hold this against you. What a hard-working church, faithful, serving the Lord, preaching and teaching and protecting the word of the Lord. But yet I have one thing against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You had forsaken the love you had at first. If you notice something in this passage of scripture, do you realize that in verse 44, that those on the left, the unrighteous people, that they are also referring to King Jesus as Lord? They're, they says, Lord, when did we see you hungry? They are calling him Lord, Lord. When did we see you? And you remember that passage of scripture in Matthew 7, 21, when it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly. He says, I will tell them plainly. I never knew you away from me you were doing a lot of things for me you were busy out there but you were doing the right things but for the wrong reasons you see he's more interested in our relationship in our love relationship with him than in our service out there he wants us to serve and we serve as a byproduct of this relationship we just don't run out there and do things like we do it in the impulse of the love and the grace that we have experienced from Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so he wants to ignite that burning love desire you had when you first met him. You remember that first time you met Jesus? That's the main reason why we find Jesus right here. As you turn to chapter 26, Jesus is heading to the cross. And he's heading to the cross, committed because of love. He's heading to the cross for God so loved the world. One of the things that I always try not to do as I think about missions and ministry, because you can easily limit the gospel to charity. The gospel cannot and will never be charity because the price that Jesus paid is too high. And you see, charity is optional. But my commitment to God because of his grace and his love, I can't help it. Because of love. Paul had it right when he said, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing, nothing. And so as a church, I think this passage of Scripture just wants to refresh our minds that there is a day, a final day, that this history as we know it will come to an end and we will stand before King Jesus. Aren't you awaiting for that day? That's not a bad day. If you look in Revelation, I was looking at it, John's final prayer was, come, Jesus, come. It's just a day of revelation. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6 says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Pastor, why do you like to preach so much about love? Isn't God love? What he says, how they will know us as disciples and followers of Jesus. If you love my disciples. And so, last week, Pastor Rotramil defined 
the process uh, discipleship, as the process of becoming deeper in your following of Jesus, becoming like Jesus. I would add becoming great lovers like Jesus. This is what discipleship should help happen in our walk with Jesus. If you should ask Noji or, or, or Charlie Horak or Sam, any one of those working in our International Student Fellowship Ministry, I always like to hear Charlie saying, you know, they, they have shared testimonies, many testimonies. The one question that the international student asks them when they go and help them, and they go into their apartments and help them with furnitures, the one question that they normally ask is, why do you do this? Why you do it? They are not asking, where did you get the furnitures from? They are asking, why you do this? Because they are so impressed to see strangers loving on them in this way. And Charlie said when he, when he hears that, those questions, a big smile comes to his face because he's praying and waiting for them to ask that question because that's the best opportunity that he has to say, yes, because Jesus loves me. He died for me because of his grace. I am saved. I have eternal life with Jesus, and I cannot help but to share. We cannot help but to share this love with you. People need the Lord. Amen? People need food. People need clothes. People who are in hospital need someone to visit him and care for him. Even those in prison, they need someone to go and visit him because they also need the Lord. You see, we don't go and do these things because, not even because it's the right thing to do. We don't do things because, or shouldn't do things because it is politically right or politically wrong. We do it because Jesus did it for us. Amen? He loved us. And so we do it impulsed by the love that we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that's why discipleship is so vital and important. So you remember that in this Matthew 25, and I'm finished here, Matthew 25 is the last sermon of Jesus. The last sermon. If you go to John chapter 21, verses 15 through 18 or 19, you will find Jesus' first message after his resurrection. He has been in the grave for three days. He was raised from the grave and now he comes back. And I love this story, I love this story. The disciples, Peter and the disciples, they abandoned the ministry, no more missions for them, and they went back to their old trades, they are out there fishing. And Peter glimpsed someone along the beach, and when he realized that it's Jesus, he jumped into the water and he ran towards Jesus. And I guess he embraced him. Uh, there he finds Jesus grilling fish, tortilla, the best in the world. Are you hungry? He's always feeding, isn't it? He's always feeding. And they ate. And then he takes Peter to the side. And he didn't even ask Peter, how is church? How is First Baptist Church, Peter? How many ministers are you all doing? How many people are you all feeding? How many people are you all clothing? How is the clothes closet doing? He didn't ask that. Are you attending worship? Are you attending Sunday school? He didn't ask that. The only thing that Jesus wanted to know about Peter as he is about to recommit him into the ministry is Peter, 
Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I, know, I, you know, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Well, take care of my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. When that final day comes, because it's coming, what will you hear? Depart or welcome? Let us stand. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. And we pray this morning, Lord, that you will help each one of us to continue falling head heels in love with you. And Lord, we pray that because of that love that you have shown to us, that you will create in our hearts that burning desire to go and love people because you first loved us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. I'll be standing here and if you want to recommit your life to Jesus, if you want to give your life to Jesus, you can walk here. Or right where you are, just, just speak to the Lord. In Revelation chapter 4, dear, chapter 2, when Jesus exhorted them because they have lost their first love, he said to them, repent. On that final day, there will be no chance to repent, but we do here now. And so speak to him as you listen to this hymn and see how is your level, your love level with Jesus this morning. Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for The next Ma Meetup will be Tuesday, September 28th at 9 a.m. at Cimarron Park. Bring your children for a morning of connection as we pray, play, and share. We have recently renovated part of our Arizona building to use as a hub for community outreach and ministry. This Sunday, September 26th, join us for the opportunity to see and learn more about Grace Place and how you can be part of this special ministry. Register today for a Redeeming Art Ministry class and learn more about the heart of God through creativity and the development of a technical skill. We will offer testimony painting on Sunday evenings from October 10th to November 14th and Composition and God's Design on October 13th through November 17th. Head to fbcep.com art ministry for more information and to sign up. 
We are thrilled to announce the upcoming 2022 Upward Basketball and Cheerleading season. Volunteer registration will open on Wednesday, September 29th, and participant registration will open on October 10th. Be sure to keep an eye out for more information. Our FBC Youth Fall Retreat is this weekend, October 1st through 3rd, and we need you registered by tomorrow, Monday, September 27th. That's right, we're giving you two options to participate in the retreat. You can join us for the full thing, Friday through Sunday, or you can sign up to come up on Saturday and stay with us through the end of the retreat on Sunday afternoon. That's all available through registration online at the youth page of the FBCEP.com website. Register by Monday. And for the church, all ages, join us Saturday, October 2nd, for the church picnic time between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. There's no cost for that. So just come up to Aspendale, enjoy the activities, have a great lunch, join in with a prayer and praise service along with the youth as part of their retreat, and then still have time to come home and enjoy the rest of the weekend. We need you registered in RSVP through the church picnic link on our website by tomorrow, Monday, September 27th. There's no cost, just a love offering to support Aspendale. So join us for the FEC Youth Fall Retreat and the FEC Church Picnic Day at Aspendale this coming weekend. Get online, sign up today. 